In the previous video, we established some terminology regarding transformation of functions. There are two kinds of transformation shifts and stretch or compression. Shifts occur when you add or subtract a constant, and stretch or compression occurs when you multiply or divide by a constant. So let's talk about a little summary. Arithmetic operation of add or subtract and we're talking about positive constants, then you get a vertical shift up or vertical shift down if the constant is added or subtracted respectively with the output of the function. On the other hand, you get a horizontal shift left or right respectively if you add a constant or subtract a constant in the input of the function. And again, don't forget, vertical and horizontal asymptotes also shift with the graph, whether it's up, down, or left, right. If it's up, down movement, it's the horizontal asymptote that will move. If it is left, right movement, it's the vertical asymptote that will move. The vertical stretch or compression occurs when you multiply or divide the output by a constant, and horizontal compression or stretch occurs if you multiply or divide by a constant in the input of the function. So you can see that vertical stretch is when you multiply the output by a constant that's bigger than 1. Or you can also think of it as y divided by b or 1 over b times y equals f of x. On the other hand, Horizontal compression occurs when you have y equals f of ax or x divided by 1 over a, where a is bigger than 1. Horizontal stretch occurs when you have x divided by a or 1 over ax. We also, in addition, get reflection or additive inverses. Additive inverse of the output will give you reflection across the x-axis. Additive inverse of the input will give you reflection across the y-axis. So in order to be able to do examples for transformation of functions, you are going to have to remember library of functions that you established in chapter 1. So let's take a quick review of library of functions. So go ahead, pause the video here, and see if you recall what the basic shape of these graphs are. Now again, remember, you can't forget that you can never, ever, ever get graphing problems wrong. Why? Because you can always make a t-table and plug in points. Because the more points you plot, the better your rough sketch will look like. All you have to do is make a t-table. So either go off of your memory or Make a table and plot the graphs. Go ahead, pause the video here. Don't wait for the answers. This would be really good review, because then this section would be really easy for you. So go ahead. You finished all of it? No, no, go ahead. Finish every single graph here, please. And if there are asymptotes, plot the asymptotes. Go ahead, pause the video. I know I cannot see you, but please really figure out what these graphs are before you continue. All right, let's see if you got them right if you've come back after pausing. Absolute value x is this v shape. x to the power 2n will be shapes similar to the parabola. The higher the power, the wider it is at the base and narrower it is on points that are bigger than 1 or smaller than negative 1 because there are higher odd powers will be this squiggly or S shape. 1 over x to even power will give you asymptotes at x equals 0 and y equals 0, and both ends are facing up. 1 over x to odd power, you have one end from the left going down, the other end is going up close to 0, and 0 is still the asymptote x equals 0, and y equals 0 is still asymptote. Even root will give you that shape. Odd root will give you uh, S shape. 
exponential functions when a is greater than 1 will be that shape. So in other words, e to power x, remember what e is. e is a number between 2 and 3, 2.71. So that shape will be then very much like the a to power x when a is bigger than 1. Natural log x is log base e or inverse function of e to the power x. And when a is between 0 and 1, you'll have exponential decay. The log base a graph will then be its inverse. And the log base a of x when a is greater than will be b, the inverse of a to power x. So this is the library of functions that you want to carry with you all the time. And that will allow you to do many, many problems of transformation of functions. Let's go see if you can identify the base function. The base function will be one of these that you see here. And then we will do transformations on it. So go ahead, identify the base function and then sketch the graph of all of these functions. Go ahead, pause the video here, identify base functions if you need to make a chart of points, and then plot all of these graphs that you see here. Go ahead. All right, some of you are saying, well, how do I identify the base function? You can see what is the common underlying theme across all of these graphs. And also, what is happening to them? You're adding, you're subtracting, you're dividing, whatever. So look for what operations are the constants doing. If you take away all the constants, what's left? The constants that are added or subtracted or multiplied by either on the output or the input. If you take those out, can you see what the base function would be? Good. The base function here is going to be what? absolute value x. And so now go ahead, make a table, plot points, now that we have identified the base function and see if you can sketch the graph. You can refer back to the library of functions that you have. Go ahead, pause the video and see what you can do. All right, assuming you've come back, hopefully you've done all of them, we have a table of values. We have 0, 0, negative 1, 1, 1, 1, negative 2, 2, and 2, 2. So if you plot, that's how the absolute value x graph looks like. If you know how the graph looks like, you don't have to make the table. It's just there for somebody who forgot the library of functions and how the basic shape is. So now, how does the graph of y equals x minus 2 look like? So again, you can make a table so the 0, 0 will now will have to be 2, 0 because only when you plug x equals 2 you will get 0. So you can see that this is the original shape that you saw for absolute value x and so x minus 2, if you plot those points you're going to take the original and shift it 2 to the right. And so again you can see the coordinates here then. We have 2, 0, 3 and 1, 1 and 1, 4 and 2, and 0 and 2. Those are similar coordinates that you had on the original graph. So our graph of y equals x minus 2 is the base graph shifted 2 to the right. And when you shift left right, the only coordinates that will change are the x coordinates and not the y coordinates from the original base graph. So that tells you in the next graph then, Again, it's the x-coordinate that's going to change. Instead of right 2, you will go left 2. And then again, you can see instead of 0, 0, you are at negative 2, 0. And all the points shifted to the left 2. Y-coordinates remain the same. So in general, if you have a function evaluated at x minus 2 instead of f of x, then how do you interpret all of these components? The x that you see here, the x is your transformed function's input x coordinate. This is the number that you're plugging in. So when you had absolute value x minus 2 and you made the xy table, the x is what you were plugging into the absolute value function. 
the whole thing, x minus 2, is the base function's input or x coordinate. So for example, if I were to put x equals 2, 2 minus 2, 0, 0 is the base function's input, whereas 2 is the transformed function's input. The whole thing here is going to be the base function's output coordinate, and what comes out of it, this y coordinate, is the transformed function's y coordinate. If you wrote x plus 2, same thing, except now, instead of subtracting a 2, you're adding a 2, but the components would mean exactly the same thing. You have the red x is what you're plugging into to get the x coordinates for a transformed function. The whole x plus 2 is the base function's input. The f of that would be the base function's output. And this y here is the transformed function's output or y coordinate. All right, let's see if you can do absolute value x plus 1 in the same manner then, except this time the plus 1 is not with the input but the output. So you can think of it as y minus 1 equals absolute value x or y equals absolute value x plus 1. So pause the video, see what you can do. So when you make the xy chart, this time the x-coordinate remains the exact same x-coordinate as the original function, absolute value x, which is our base function. And then you plug in x equals negative 2, and then whatever the output for the old function was, add a 1 to it. So instead of 0, 0, now we have 0, 1. And so our graph, original graph, shifted up 1. You can do the same for y plus 1. So this time, y plus 1 equals absolute value x, or y equals absolute value x minus 1. So this time, instead of going up 1, you're going down 1. So again, let's review what just happened. If you have generically y equals f of x plus 1, the x is our transformed and base function's input because x coordinate never changed. This whole thing, f of x plus 1, is our one more than base function's output. The one more is because you're doing plus 1. f of x is the base function's output. So what is resulting is that the y coordinate, y equals, is the transform function's output. It's good to have a sense of what is happening because this will allow you to do any function, not just absolute value x function. If I rewrote that as y plus 1 equals f of x, so if I wrote that as, for the second function, if I wrote that as y plus 1 equals f of x, or y equals f of x minus 1, then Again, x is the transformed and the base function's input because the x-coordinate is not changing. This here, f of x, is our base function's output, and y plus 1 be 1 more than the transformed function's output. That's what the y plus 1 is. So y plus 1 means the y is our transformed function's output, and then plus a 1, so that's why you're adding a 1. All right, 2 times absolute value x. So here's our original graph. If I know what it does, all the y coordinates are getting multiplied by 2. So for the base function's y coordinate, multiplying by 2. So 1, 1 will become 1, 2. 2, 2 will become 2, 4, and so on. So you don't always have to make a table if you know what is happening table will guarantee that you got the right answer. That way you don't have to worry if you know the base function or not. What if you multiply by negative 2 instead of positive 2? All the values will become negative, so 0, 0 will remain 0, 0. 1, 2 will become 1, negative 2. Negative 1, 2 will become negative 1, negative 2. So if you plot them, you get this graph. All right, what do you do here then? It's negative 2 times absolute value x plus the order of operations, parentheses first. Absolute value is going to act like a parentheses, so you do x plus 3 first. 
We already saw that x plus 3 will move the graph to the left 3, and then you will multiply by negative 2. So left 3 first, then multiply by negative 2, which will reflect it across the x-axis, and times 2 will stretch it vertically by a factor of 2. So instead of negative 2, 1, you'll have negative 2, negative 2. Instead of 4, 1, you will have negative 4, negative 2. Here, it's the same as this graph, negative 2 times x plus 3, and then a plus 5. The plus 5 will move the graph up 5. So here, we're going to have left 3 reflect across the x-axis and then move it up 5. So your final graph will be this. The previous stage is to show you all the pieces. The green graph was the original V-shape going up. The red graph is its reflection, and then taking the red graph up 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 will give you the graph of absolute value negative 2 times x plus 3 plus 5. All right, let's see if you can do this graph. You are given the base graph of g of x, and you figure out what 2 times g of x would look like and negative 2 times g of x look like. You can see here, it's not one of the standard base graphs from the library of functions, but a different graph they gave you. So it might be beneficial to make a chart and see what the basic points are on this. 0, 0, 2, 3, 4, 0, 6, and negative 3, and 8, 0 kind of define the basic shape of this graph. You can plot more points if you need them. So now, 2 times g of x, which means that you're taking the old y coordinates and multiplying them by 2, which means x coordinate remains the same. So if you do that, you'll have 2 times 0, 2 times 3, 2 times 0, 2 times negative 3, 2 times 0. And if you plot those, this red graph here, you see, 0, 0, 2, 6, 4, 0, 6, negative 6, and 8, 0. So you can see it's stretched by a factor of 2 vertically. Here, it's going to do the same and reflect. So again, you can make the chart, multiply by negative 2, and plot. And you can see that anything that was positive became negative, negative became positive, so it's a reflection across the x-axis. So in general then, if you have y equals 2 times f of x, x is the original functions and the transform function's input coordinate, 2 times f of x will be 2 times more than the base function's output, and this y here is the transform function's output. y over 2 equals f of x, so it's just written in a different form. Again, same principles. This is f of x, which is base function's output, x is transformed and base function's input because we're not changing the x coordinate, and y divided by 2, so that would be half of the transform function's output. So go ahead, pause the video, and see if you can do this. This time the multiplication by 2 and division by 2 is with the input and not the output. So again, we have our coordinates and see what you can do. Go ahead, try it on your own. So this time, the y-coordinate will remain the same, and you have to figure out what the x-coordinates would be. So you can see all the x-coordinates had to be halved so that when you plug it in, you get 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times 1 is 2, and g of 2 is 3. And so if you plot it, you will see that it became a horizontal compression by a factor of 2. Similarly, x over 2, you will notice all the x coordinates had to be doubled from the original so that when you plug it in, half of that will give you what you had originally, g of 2. So half of 4 is 2, so g of 2 is 3. And so when you plot it, you will see in this case, the graph got horizontally stretched by a factor of 2. You can also think of it as that if originally it went from 0 to 8, now it's going from 0 to 16. It got stretched horizontally. 
So again, our x is our input of the x coordinate. It's the transformed function's input, and then twice the transformed function's input. This is going to be our base function's input x coordinate. This is our y coordinate for base function, and what comes out here is going to be our transform function's y coordinate. We've done many of these now, so pause the video here and you label the base function's input output, transformation function's input output. Go ahead and see what you can do. In the minimum, you'll be able to see whether you got it or not, so go ahead. All right, assuming you've come back, let's take a look. This x is going to be our transform function's input or x coordinate. The whole thing, x over 2, is going to be our base function's input or x coordinate. f of x over 2 is going to be our base function's output or y coordinate. And the y is going to be our transform function's output or y coordinate. Good. If you didn't get it, take examples, do more examples, and then you'll be able to identify which is which. All right, let's do some examples then. So for all the functions that are coming, you will have to sketch the graph of the base function or relation, the transformations, plot them on the same axis, and explain how you figured out what the shape would look like. Show all relevant parts of the graph, find domain and range of the function or relation that you graphed based on your graph, and then list all the vertical and horizontal asymptotes if you have any. So go ahead and pause the video here and see what you can do. One thing at a time, don't forget. Just take a deep breath. One thing at a time, identify the base function, and then continue from there. Go ahead, pause the video. Are you sure you finished? All right, base function. Remember, whatever is done to the input or output, you hide all that. That will allow you to see what the base function is. So in this case, the base function is 1 over x. Because in the denominator, you have x minus 1. So if you take that away, you'll see it's 1 over x. So our base function looks like that. If you forgot, you just make t table, plug values in, and sketch the graph. So now we are replacing the x with x minus 1, which means that our graph is going to shift 1 to the right. So 1 to the right, our asymptotes before were x equals 0, y equals 0. Shifting to the right one, the y equals 0, which is horizontal asymptote, doesn't change. The vertical asymptote will move from 0, x equals 0, to x equals 1. So vertical asymptote is at x equals 1. Horizontal asymptote is at y equals 0. We are also asked to find domain and range. You can see domain here is all x values negative infinity to 1 and 1 to infinity. And then our range is going to be negative infinity to 0 and 0 to infinity, because the asymptotes are contributing here to the domain and range. All right, go ahead, pause the video, and see if you can do this next function. When there are multiple things happening, order of operation, remember parentheses first, and then from there you can move on. Go ahead. So again, here our base function will be identified as y equals 1 over t squared, which you recall was this graph. Now, replacing t with t minus 1, because parentheses first. So that will be similar to what we did in the previous example. Shift 1 to the right, and then the plus 2 will shift it up to. Good. So here is our graph, shifting 1 to the right and 2 up. So here our asymptotes are going to be t equals 1 for vertical asymptote. Horizontal asymptote will be y equals 2, because we shifted up 2 from 0. And our domain will be negative infinity to 1, 1 to infinity. You can see that the range is going to be 2 to infinity. 
So again, the asymptotes are contributing to the domain and the range. All right, pause the video here and see if you can do this one. Go ahead, pause the video, see what you can do. All right, what is the base function here? So we will hide the plus two and the minus three. So y equals e to the x is our base function, which looks like this, where y equals zero is our asymptote. And so then we have, we have to go shift left two for the x plus two, left two and down three. So left two, down three, that's uh, this graph here. Our domain, and range and horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptote, y equals negative three. There is no vertical asymptote here. Domain will be negative infinity to infinity, and the range will be negative three to infinity. And you can see that from the graph, actually. All right, go ahead, pause the video and see what you can do here. Natural log, x minus three plus two. Assuming you've come back, our base function is going to be y equals natural log x, which is the inverse function of e to the x. And now what are we doing? x minus three, so we're gonna go right three and plus two on the outside to make it go up two. So right three, which will be y equals natural log x minus three, and then shift up two, and that's our graph. Our asymptote will then be x equals three is vertical asymptote. Domain will be three to infinity, and the range is negative infinity to infinity. Hopefully you understood how to do some of these problems. Now what if you are given a graph? Then you have to make sure, like we did before, plot points on it that represent the structure of the graph, and then move left, right, up, down, stretch, vertically or compress, and so on. So in summary then, again, we need our library of functions, which were all of these graphs that you did in chapter one. And then using that, you will go ahead and do basically shifting up, down, left or right, depending on whether it's adding or subtracting of the output or the input, and then vertical stretch or compression or horizontal stretch or compression, depending on whether you have multiplication or division of the output or the input. And then if there's a negative sign, don't forget to add the reflection. If it's additive inverse of the output, you will be reflecting across x-axis. Additive inverse of the input, you will reflect across the y-axis. Hopefully you understood the concepts, and if not, just practice more examples. Use this chart and the library of functions to practice, and you have free recall of these concepts so that you can succeed in the rest of chapter two, because this is the foundation for the rest of the few sections.